Hey everyone, welcome to our intro to Mobisec. Uh, I apologize, even though my name says Kevin Johnson as the organizer, this is actually James Jardine. And we originally had planned on both Kevin and I doing this presentation, uh, but unfortunately due to some travel that came up uh, just recently, Kevin was unable to attend. So you're unfortunately stuck listening to me the entire time, but hopefully that's a good thing. You lose a little bit of our bickering back and forth, but at least you don't have to deal with our bickering back and forth, right? Uh, so today we're going to talk about Mobisec. And if you've never heard of it, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have an understanding of what it is. And if you have heard of it, hopefully you'll get a little bit more idea of how it can be used and how we use it during mobile penetration tests. And uh, as we teach classes on this, I'm very excited to talk about how we're going to be teaching a, f a full two-day course uh, at Black Hat USA this year. Uh, so that this is kind of an intro to what Mobisec is. And then in that type of course, we actually get really deep into using the tools and assessing mobile applications. But hopefully, if you've got a little bit of experience doing web applications or network security, it, it's very similar, the ideas behind it. So here we're going to walk through what Mobisec is. and you know, how we can use it. So as I mentioned, my name is James Jardine. Uh, just real quickly about me, because really we're not here to talk about me. Uh, we're here to talk about Mobisec, but I'm a principal security consultant here at Secure Ideas. I'm a course author and instructor where I've written stuff for SANS. I've done instructing at DerbyCon, besides Orlando, uh, and a bunch of SANS events, open source contributor, uh, heavily into podcasting, if you follow any of the podcasts list, uh, listed there, Professional Evil Perspective, which is Kevin and I, Down the Rabbit Hole, which is Raphael Los and myself, and DevelopSec, which is fairly new, but that, that's just me. Uh, so it's not as good because I don't have back and forth, but it's good. We cover some good topics. Uh, and then I also uh, blog a lot on both my own personal blog and on the Secure Ideas blog. So if there's any everything out there that you're interested in looking for, definitely check out our blog. We put up some really excellent posts that are very knowledgeable, provide you a lot of information, and hopefully provide you stuff that you can actually use rather than just providing information. Because uh, at Secure Ideas, we really want to provide stuff that is useful to people, not just, well, we're just going to put content up to put content up. I want to put content up that's actually useful that you're actually going to use. So what are we going to talk about? Um, obviously, we'll talk a little bit about the overview of mobile security testing. Uh, this is somewhat new, somewhat not as new. Um, you know, we talked about this for a few years now. And the Mobisec project, as we start talking about it, has been around for uh, a few years as well. Uh, so we're starting to do a little bit more mobile testing, but there's some things we want to think about from that mobile side that's different. All right, we'll talk about why do we need to do mobile testing. We'll introduce the Mobisec Live environment. We'll look at the structure and the testing tools. We're really here going to talk about why do we need an environment like Mobisec? Why do we need this structure, these tools pre-built? I can go down and download any of these tools, right? We'll talk about why it is that we want this type of environment. Does anybody out there use Samurai WTF or Backtrack or Kali Linux? Any of those, this is going to be very similar. We'll do a real quick live demo where we'll just kind of look at the Mobisec environment so you can get a feel for what it looks like, how it works, what's included. We'll talk a lot about what's included, what's not included, and the reasons why some of that stuff doesn't get included into the distribution. Uh, and then we'll talk about how we at Security has actually leveraged the DARPA CFT program uh, to help us be able to build this distribution to be able to make it available to everybody. So mobile security schmerity, right? Why is it important? What are we talking about here? Why do we need mobile security? I mean, does anybody even have a mobile device? Well, probably everybody listening has at least one mobile device, probably more than one mobile device. We've got people with the iPhone, the Android devices, then you've got iPad. So it's not just your phone, but also your tablet. There's all kinds. I have both an iPhone and a Microsoft device, I know probably the only one with a Microsoft device, but I do have a Microsoft phone. 
and albeit I don't use it very often, I do have it for testing purposes, for research purposes, but I have two phones connected. My wife has a phone. I mean, we have a bunch of devices. Just in my household, the number of mobile devices that we have is kind of uncanny. And if you start thinking about the stuff that we do on these mobile devices, we really start getting concerned about the privacy and all these other features that are there that we really kind of have to start thinking about. Like, wait a minute, this is no longer just a phone where I call somebody. This is actually a device that has tons of information that I need to start thinking about because I don't want to lose that information. Think about the increased capability and the affordability of a lot of these different devices. I mean, some of these devices now, I mean, they've run faster than, you know, some of the older computers that are out there. I mean, it's just unbelievable the processing power we have, the amount of storage that's on these devices that, you know, because of course we can't just have a device that does phone stuff, not just communication, right? What do we use our phones for? Well, we got to use it for gaming. I mean, that's what it's for. It's for entertainment. How do I entertain myself when I'm bored? I go pick up my son, um, which is just down the street uh, at the local school, and it, it's funny to me to watch. Uh, you know, there's no, no buses. It's a private school. So the parents in the car line waiting to pick up their children. And I mean, there'll be 25 cars, 30 cars in the car line waiting for the release. And every single one of them, somebody's sitting there on their phone, either talking on the phone or, you know, reading on the phone, whether that's doing Facebook, whether it's texting somebody, whether it's playing games, I don't know what they're doing, but every single one of them is doing something on that device while they're waiting, right? We don't have downtime anymore. I was actually coming home from mountain biking one day. I know I live in Florida, but it is still is called mountain biking, even though it's just off-road biking. Uh, we do have hills that are the size of like a one-story room. <laughs> so they're not huge. But I was coming back, and probably for three miles, I was in the lane next to, and I know this was a bad idea. I shouldn't have stayed in the lane. I was in the lane next to a lady that the entire time she was texting and on her phone for three miles. And I can't even, it's amazing how close she came to hitting the median in the middle of the road. But yet she didn't. I don't know how she didn't because I thought a few times she was going over. She'd come real close and then swerve back over. But the entire time, wrists on the steering wheel, phone, and thumbs just a going away. And we don't have this downtime anymore, right? I mean, we, we have this accessibility that we never had before. I can access all this information at any moment. I can see what, how much is in my bank account. I can see you know, what my friends are saying on Facebook. I can get messages sent to me. Ah, it's so easy. I mean, it really doesn't get much better than that, does it? Well, unless it actually just talked to us and I didn't have to read it. But then that kind of defeats the purpose. Don't I want to read it and not talk to it. If I want to talk, I just call somebody. So we're seeing so much being brought out to these devices and they start to become a target. Uh, and so we have to start thinking about, well, what can we do about security with these devices? So we say they're becoming a target, right? Why are they a target rich environment? Well, just like why Microsoft Windows is such a target for viruses and malware and all that type of stuff. Right? There's lots of devices. <clears throat> and when you have lots of something, you're opening yourself up to being a target. Um, back in the web world, it was always, well, if we have lots of data or lots of financial information, well, that makes us a target. But if I don't have much, I'm not as much. Right? We've learned that that's not really the case. And we'll see that really with mobile devices as well. As a whole, there's a lot of them. And so when we say there's a lot of devices, we really mean, I mean, they're, they're really everywhere. I mean, everybody has them, as I just mentioned. So because everybody has them, it's a good in to being able to do stuff, right? They're always on. They're always connected. How often do you turn your phone off? Maybe on an airplane, but do you really turn it off or do you put it in flight mode? I know they say don't put it in flight mode, even though that's what 
airplane mode is for, but put it in flight mode, something like that. It's rare that we ever turn the phone off. And how many people connect their devices to their home networks when they're home? I know I do. Yeah, virtually raising my hand here. Well, really raising my hand. But I connect my device to my home network. So when I'm home, I'm not using my 3G or LTE or whatever cellular network that I'm on, right? I want to use my home network. So we're seeing that now we're home. That's another device for somebody to gain access into a network. Maybe you go to a work environment. It's getting connected. So we have this resource that we're never turning off, always connected somehow to the internet. So we have to think about how do we protect it because the bad guys are going to want to start messing with this. I mean, I want to sit there and look for something that somebody says, hey, you know what? I can get to 90% of the people if I attack this. <laughs> well, of course I'm going to go that route versus picking something that not that many people have. You want to go with numbers. Uh, from attacking, especially from a blind perspective, it's a numbers game. The more I send out, the better chance I have of getting somebody to fall for it. It's kind of like all this, the the junk mail you receive, right? I mean, hey, let's send it to everybody, and the more we can send it to, the better chance we have of one more person falling for this, right? I'm going to buy this. Oh, I got this. Yeah, this is a great idea. I'm going to get it. So they're always on. They're always connected. This is something that is um, an issue with our home computers, right? That's what makes our home computers much more of a target as well now. Oftentimes people say, well, I don't have anything on my computer. Why would anybody want to target me? But we do because you're always connected. It's a resource. The phone is a resource. And as we talked about performance, that's something I want to attack. The phone, because now it's always on. It's probably got a broadband connection. Let me use that as a foothold to start doing attacks. Uh, the amount of stuff that we store on our devices, right? We put our entire lives on our devices. We have Facebook, which has everything. As I mentioned, bank accounts. We do our bank accounts, our retirement services, email. I mean, if you can think of it, it's probably on that device. So that right there is a good target of, look at all the sensitive information that could possibly be on that device or that that device has access to. And then of course, to the cloud with it all. I'm gonna take my data and not only store it on my device, but I'm gonna start storing it up in the cloud because my device doesn't have enough storage space. So now I need to go store stuff up in the cloud and reap the benefit of that. Now I'm putting my information someplace else. So we have to have lots of concern over what we're doing with our mobile. So some of our challenges with mobile testing, how many people have tested mobile applications um, that are out there? You know, how many people are doing this on a, on a normal basis, right? It's difficult to test some mobile applications, right? And all the time we're seeing updates to the software, the OS, the applications, right? Things are changing all the time. So one of our keys is, well, we have to find the right tools for the job. And you could sit there and Google search all day. Let me find what tools I need to, to test certain things. Uh, but you have to look for these tools. It's not like web where everything is just laying out there of, hey, here's a list of 500 tools that you can use to test a web application. We're starting to get into mobile, whereas more tools are becoming available, and we're starting to see more of those. But do you have the time, if you're getting into mobile testing and you want to test a mobile app, to actually go through and try to find all these tools and put them together? Um, you could roll your own, right? And you could create your own mobile testing tools. Uh, it's going to definitely require a significant level of effort. Um, it's going to be very time consuming, you know, so unless you've got some sort of funding behind it or just nothing to do, you know, it, it's going to take a lot of time to create these because you're going to have to learn a lot about the operating system, the applications, and, and how these devices really work. And then we have to think about, well, how do, you know, the type of device matter. Android versus iOS versus Blackberry versus the Microsoft platform, right? These are all different. So how are we going to go about creating a tool? Is it just for Android devices? Is it just for iOS devices? I mean, is it specific? How is it going to work? 
you know, understanding things like jailbreaking, breaking phones, and you know how their operating system file system is laid out, and what you can do without a tool, a tool versus creating your own. Right? What what's missing there? Uh, from a labor perspective, right? It's expensive because obviously time consuming times hourly rate equals expensive. So, you know, if you're getting paid to do this, I mean, it's, it's costly to go out and create these tools, which usually leads to tools that cost a lot of money because I can't go out and spend all this time creating a tool to then just hand it out for free, right? I mean, I, I got to get something for my labor that I've done here. Um, so oftentimes that jacks up the price on these things. And then not always fully tested to work, right? I mean, how many times do you go get a tool that somebody wrote and you're like, oh man, this is gonna do exactly what I need it to do. You download it and eh, it doesn't quite work for your situation. Or it doesn't really quite work for any situation. Uh, it's very difficult, uh, especially when you're dealing with people that are just kind of out on their own writing some of these tools to get good testing in. And because the, the operating systems and all this stuff are updating so frequently, what may have worked on version 0.06 all of a sudden doesn't work on 0.07, right? So you start to see a lot of issues where well, it doesn't quite work or it might work and it can be kind of difficult and the documentation always isn't the best either. So now you have to figure out how to use the tool. So there's lots of work that goes into dealing with mobile testing. So run what you brung, right? I mean, this is kind of the idea. What tools do you have? If you got them, use them. Um, you know, anyone got a tool? Anyone out there have any tools for testing mobile? I mean, you probably do. You'd be surprised. Lots of the tools that we use to test mobile are the same tools we use to test web applications. Because as we see, most of what a mobile application will do is call out to web services. Sure, it does some stuff locally, right? And there's some specific tools to be able to analyze what the application is doing on the device itself. But really, it's intercepting traffic, seeing what the application is passing back and forth between the client and the server. How can we go about looking at that? So we want to use these features that exist in our current tools, like our proxies. Use the proxies, use things like Wireshark to be able to intercept the packet level data that's going back and forth so you can analyze it. Right? We don't have to go out and look for a whole bunch of new tools, but when it does come time to, to use tools that don't match our feature set, we have to know where we can go get those. Right? So that's where we start running into some specific tools to do certain things. And obviously we want to have something that's affordable and robust enough that it'll help us with our testing. Um, we like to think of affordable as free. Uh, I would say that just because MobiSec is free, right? So um, is $1.99 free? Is $100 or affordable? Is $200 affordable? It really all depends, right? Some testing suites that are out there are thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. And then you get some that are that are great tools that are really, really cheap. Uh, Burp Suite, for example, where you can get it for like $3.99 or $2.99. Uh, you know, some people may think that's not affordable, but compare that to some of the other tools that it could compete with, and it's much more affordable than those other tools. So it's really about identifying the needs that you have as a tester to be able to go out and start testing this stuff. And you want something that's actually going to work. Uh, I hate, I hate getting tools where I download them, I think it's going to do exactly what I want it to do, and then as I start getting into it, it's just not working. My worst is dealing with stuff that runs on Ruby because I swear I never have the right version of Ruby for any tool that I load. Um, every application I've ever loaded for Ruby on my machine is always a work. <laughs> It is a severe effort for me. I don't know why I've got the Ruby version manager, but for some reason, it is just some level of effort that my computer never wants to be set up properly for Ruby. Um, so, you know, we have these issues of, hey, I got a tool, but maybe it doesn't 
work, or maybe it's a pain to set it up. So, MobySec, what is it, right? Why do we have such a thing? And as I just stated with my problems with Ruby, that's one good reason right there. Uh, but what is it? I mean, as I mentioned, if you've heard of Samurai WTF, if you've heard of Backtrack, if you've used any of those, if you've used Kali Linux, right, that's kind of replaced Backtrack now, uh, it's a live CD. It's a fully built system that already has these great cool tools already built onto it. Uh, so all these tools that we're thinking about, instead of us having to go and download them and install them and update them and do all this stuff, it all comes pre-configured on the MobiSec environment. So that's kind of cool, right? I don't have to go spend time looking for this stuff anymore. I'll just go get the environment. I download it, I run it in a VM, um, as we'll see when I actually walk through a little bit of it and show the interface. Um, I have it running in VM Fusion. So I download the ISO, I can burn it to a disk and run it directly off the disk or I can run it into something like VM Fusion. You can install it, so that way it stays. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, it is open source, which is even better, right? Anybody can contribute. If you want to contribute, let us know, and uh, we can get you on the right track to being help contribute this thing. But it's all open source. I'm not trying to hide anything. We make it freely available. It was put together by the Secure Ideas team, um, and, uh, you know, we wanted an environment that we could easily fire up and have all the stuff that we needed or a majority of the stuff that we needed. There may be some tools that don't exist on there. The majority of the stuff that we needed to be able to go out and start a mobile pen test, right? We've got our application. We've got some device, whatever, something that's already built for us, that's already set up. Runs on Ubuntu LTS 10.04. Um, a lot of people are familiar with this. It's a pretty popular platform. Uh, I'm sure at some point this will get uh, upgraded uh, to a newer version, uh, but we do like to stick with the LTS so that way we know it's going to stick around for a while. So, so but what are some of the benefits of MobiSec? Well, as I mentioned, all the tools, but none of the fat. And what we mean by that is, I talked about Samurai WTF, which has a lot of these tools that you'll see in MobiSec as well. Backtrack, Kali Linux, right? These have a lot of tools. Most of these tools will exist on those. But they also have so many other tools that you can get lost in what you're trying to do. If I'm just doing a mobile test, well, then I want to try to limit how much tools I'm looking at to just the ones that I can use for my mobile testing. I don't need to look at these other ones, right? If I'm not doing anything with forensics, I'm not doing anything with some of this other stuff, it's not a network test. I don't need all those crazy network tools out there. Well, now I don't have to worry about trying to sift through those. I've got all the stuff that I just need for a mobile assessment and nothing else. Um, so for those of you that have a little bit of ADHD, you know, you can't help yourself, but to, oh, what's this tool do? As you're surfing around in one of these live environments, we kind of get rid of a bunch of that other stuff and, and try to limit that scope, limit that focus to what we're trying to work on. It's affordable. As I mentioned, it's free. All you have to do is download it. Um, so I guess it's not technically free since you have to actually spend the time downloading it. You have to click a button, wait for it to download. You can do something else while you're doing that, but there is a small cost of time as far as getting it, but there's actually no cost to it. So it's very affordable. Anybody can download it as long as you've got proper equipment to be able to run it on. And I mean, it's Ubuntu 10.04. How much how much equipment do you need? Running it directly off a CD, you don't need that much RAM. Uh, if you want to run it in a VM, or we usually recommend giving it, you know, two gigs. I usually give any of my VMs two gigs at least. But give it a couple gigs of RAM to be able to run. Uh, you don't need a whole lot. It's everything you need. And it's when you need it, right? It's just sitting there. Whether you burn it to a disk, whether it's a VM sitting idle, all the tools that you need are there. A new release comes out, download the new release. Uh, doesn't take that long to be able to go out and say, oh, hey, 1.3 is out there, which we should have another release coming out fairly soon. Let me just download that. 
and you click on it and it pulls it on down. Um, and as I mentioned, having another release soon, uh, we're always trying to improve the MobiSec environment. So new stuff, we have some new stuff in mind that we're wanting to add on to it that's come out recently uh, to make it better. We're trying to always improve it because, as I mentioned, with our Black Hat class, uh, we taught a MobiSec class at DerbyCon last year. And, you know, we're always constantly trying to find out what are the latest tools that people are using and getting those in that environment if it's possible. Because we want you to have the tools that you need. I don't want to put together an environment that's not going to have what you need to do the task that you're given. I want to make sure that you have everything you need to be able to do that task. So who would use this? Well, you got your IT mobile admins, right? Maybe they want to be able to identify flaws in their mobile environments. Um, you know, it's a way for them to be able to install some of the tools or have the tools available to them without installing it directly on one of their machines. Oftentimes we see many companies aren't fans of some of these tools being installed because they see them as the quote unquote hacker tools um, or as Kevin Johnson would like to start doing italics hacker tools. Uh, he didn't like the quotes for some reason. And you know go out here and now you've got it all comp compiled in one spot that you don't have to go and install it on a separate machine. You can run it directly from memory, do your assessment, and then it's gone. Or you can load it up and only give certain people access to it, but you don't have to worry about doing the configuration and setting everything up. Security consultants, of course, right? I mean, why not have a tool like this where you can just easily throw in a disk and now all of a sudden you've got a pen test environment for mobile devices. And if whether you're doing forensics or, you know, just testing or, you know, looking at the wireless issues that are out there, all that stuff is available to be able to help you assess these things. For forensics analysts, it's got tools on there to help you reverse engineer applications. Uh, looking at, and we'll look at some of these, uh, or we'll talk about them briefly, but being able to decompile the Java code or, you know, any of that stuff. And as I mentioned, we're constantly looking for new tools to be able to add to the, the toolbox so people can see those. So our design objectives that we had for MobiSec, right? a live testing environment on an Intel computer. Uh, I don't think this will run on your old PowerBook Mac, but the newer ones, if it's Intel, it'll work. Um, or that's the goal. <clears throat> you know, it's based on an OS... This thing here says everyone is familiar with. That's a little presumptuous, I think. Uh, not everybody, I think, is familiar with Ubuntu, but uh, it, from the most part, from a security world, you're starting to see most people are familiar with a Linux or Ubuntu, that type of environment. So it's helpful that it is something that a lot of people are familiar with. Are there tons of people that never heard of it? Yes. Uh, but most people, if you're already looking at this type of project probably have some experience because uh, as you start getting in and doing security testing it's kind of hard not to get some Linux experience in at that point. It is open source, um, it's distributable because um, you know we want it to be available to anybody that wants to use it. It wouldn't be any good for us to create this and then not, not share it. Uh, you know our whole goal was let's create this project that we'll be able to share and let everybody use. Uh, we want to make sure that it was structured, um, it is structurally aligned to the testing methodology, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, but, you know, there's a specific methodology we use, and it doesn't matter what type of testing it is, whether it's network testing, web testing, mobile testing, there's a specific methodology, and there's reasons why we use these methodologies. And we wanted to make sure that we followed that. And you'll see that when we look at the menuing system that we have of how we try to follow that methodology. We wanted tools to be easy to find, right? Easy to use them. It's not easy if I have to go out and, oh man, I need SQL map. Let me go search Google for it, download it, get it installed. As I mentioned, my Ruby issues, and I know I harp on Ruby way too much, but for some reason I just hate it because it, it is just the bane of my existence. But that type of thing, Right, we've already tested this environment. 
we've put tools on here. We've ensured that they've got the right version of Ruby, that Python is installed, that all the add-ons and modules that are needed are there. All you have to do is fire it up and use it. Right, so that makes it so much easier. And I can tell you, anybody that's had to go out and install some of the tools that are out there, right? Installing stuff can be a pain. And if we can save you the time of having to go out and find it and install it and configure it, then why not use that to our advantage and run with that? It's so much easier. Uh, we do include um, some dev kits, some emulators that are there. Um, we'll see as we start looking through it a little bit more. There are some constraints to that, which we'll talk about next. Uh, but as much as we can include that we're aware of, right, we try to include that in there. It's customizable. Now I said, you know, it is a live CD. So obviously if you run it straight from the CD, not very customizable because those changes won't stick. But if you install it or put it in a VM where you can actually keep state on there, you can actually go in and add your own tools to the environment. So maybe you've got some new tools that we haven't added yet, but you'd really like to have them on there. Or you've got a professional license of Burp Suite, and you want to use that on the MobiSec environment. Well, Burp Suite's installed. Well, you can go in and add your license to it to turn it into the Pro or, or update and put the Pro license on there. You can save things on there, and that way it actually turns into this new environment. It's almost like getting a new computer that you didn't have to do anything to. Right? This is how we would wish computers could come to us shipped. Uh, you know, right now all I can do is, yeah, I'd like this much RAM, I'd like this, I'd like this, and sure, sell me Office. But wouldn't it be cool if you could actually just say, hey, look, I want a new Mac or I want a new Linux laptop, and here's all the software that I want installed on this thing and configured. That's what we're doing. So when you go run it, it doesn't matter what system you run it on, as long as it's Intel-based, the tools are going to come up. They're always going to work, and they're always available. And then you can customize it. You can update the stuff. A lot of things have SVN ties, so that way you can easily update the software that's on there and not have to go through a whole bunch of headache to do the updates for those. Now, I mentioned there are some constraints and limitations, unfortunately. But this is what we see with anything we try to do like this, right? People have different rules for their tools, so we have to abide by those. Uh, licensing and distribution restrictions. That's one of our biggest issue. I mean, if somebody's licensing doesn't allow us or their distribution doesn't allow us to put it on here, well, then obviously we can't add it to the source or, or the distribution and send it out. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty big concern. and. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Some people don't want their tools distributed unless it goes through their channels, uh, which is understandable from their standpoint. So we do our best to actually try to just include that type of information and say, hey, here's this tool, but because it doesn't, is we're not allowed to distribute it, we're going to go ahead and give you the link of where you can go get that tool, right? So we'll provide the information. So that works well for us. If we can't include it, um, you know, as I mentioned, right, we, we provide that information. And, I mean, come on, doesn't everything run on Linux? No. Right? There's a lot of stuff that doesn't run on Linux. Um, a perfect example, all of the stuff dealing with iOS. Right? Your iOS emulators, all that stuff doesn't run on Linux. So, obviously, we can't install those type of tools within the system because they're not supported under that system, right? We, maybe we can only run it on an Apple product. Maybe we can only run it in Microsoft Windows. So we don't have the ability to actually run it. So anything that we can run and we're aware of, we'll install, we'll configure, we'll get it all set up. All the other stuff, we really still include it, but we're including documentation on where you can go get it yourself. We can't distribute it or it doesn't work on this environment. But here's some information about that tool that would be great for what you're trying to do. And here's where you can go get it. And here's how it's going to work for you. So some things aren't installed. And you'll see that when we start walking through the live demo. We'll just kind of poke through the environment just a little bit that not everything is there. But we try to provide a lot of information. So the MobiSec structure, we've organized it into 
the categories of tools that we have. So you've got development tools, device forensics, penetration testing, reverse engineering, wireless analyzers. So right away, depending on what you're doing, you know exactly where you need to go within the menu because that's how the menu's set up. So if I know I'm going to be doing something development-wise, well, I start at development tools. If I'm going to be doing pen testing, well, let me start at penetration testing. You know, from doing reverse engineering. Well, I bet those tools are going to be found where? In reverse engineering. So very simple to go find these because we tried to organize them within the category of the type of testing that you might be doing. Uh, and you may be doing all of these, but when you start thinking about this is what I'm doing, well, it's a little bit easier to go in and find that topic and start drilling down from there. Uh, so that helps out quite a bit. And if you've done anything with Samurai, if you've done anything with Backtrack, uh, very similar. Right? And we, we, we try to keep that structure as well because people are familiar with those environments. We want to keep that familiarity fresh so that way you understand, oh, yeah, I know how to use this without even having any intro to it. If you use any of those other ones, you fire this up, you know what you're supposed to be doing. You know how to go in and find the applications that you need because it's very similar to the other type of applications that are out there. So the methodology, we really we, we align the tools with the pen testing methodology. So we've talked about reconnaissance, mapping, discovery, exploitation, right? I mean, these are the same four phases of methodology that we talk about when we talk about web pen testing, right? It doesn't really change because we still need to do the same thing. I still need to do reconnaissance and find out about the company creating the application or you know, more information about the application. Has developers put any information about the source code out on the internet someplace? Any type of information like that is still helpful even in the web world. Or I'm sorry, in the mobile world. So we have to still think about reconnaissance. We have to think about the mapping of the application that we're going in to test. What does the application do? Does it talk to web services? You know, does it store stuff in a local database? What are the actual functions of this mobile application? Is it a banking application? It is financial. Is it just a social app? What is that social app actually doing? Oh, it's accessing context. Well, why is it access context? Right? These are the type of things you're going to be looking at. You start getting into discovery, right? where we start looking for flaws within these systems that we've identified. And then once we find these flaws, we finally then go out and we start exploiting this stuff. Right, and then the whole rinse and repeat. Even though this is a nice top-down approach, we never really do it top-down. You're gonna start out doing some reconnaissance, you're gonna get into mapping, and you're immediately gonna find something that looks interesting. And you may skip over to exploitation, or exploitation may lead you to another system that you haven't seen before, which then brings you back to reconnaissance to think about that system, and then start mapping that system in discovery. So. You kind of bounce around through it, but you want to have a generic methodology that's out there to make sure you follow the same path every time. We want to be repeatable. We want to be able to, when we send the findings out to our customers, this is what we've got, this is how we did it, and they can actually go out and do it the same way. So you definitely want to make sure you adopt some form of methodology, whether it's this one, I'm sure there's some other methodologies out there, Feel free to pick whichever one you want, whatever works for you, but pick one because it definitely makes things a lot easier because uh, you, you start bouncing around, you realize that, hey, wait a minute, my time for testing this app is almost up and I've only tested half of the application because I got so caught up trying to get this one flaw to work that I just never got past it and I just missed testing the whole rest of the app. So as you start going through these things, maybe you see something that looks interesting during discovery. Now you try it for a couple minutes or you try a few times, then you move on, right? You write it down, move on, test some more stuff. And then once you know you've tested the entire app, then you can go back and spend some more time trying to win that one, right? I, nothing worse than finding something and you're like, yes, I know it's SQL injection, but just nothing is working. 
So you know you, you spend the whole week trying to get that one thing to work. And while maybe you get it to work and it's a huge find, you didn't get to test the whole rest of the app. Or maybe you got it, it didn't get it to work and it turns out to be a nothing find and you still haven't tested most of the app, <laughs> right? Either way, those are bad things to happen. So we wanna have that methodology to help kind of keep us on track. So the development tools that are out there, again, I mean, these are mobile device development environments, emulators, simulators, so Eclipse is already installed. There's Android emulators, but then there's also, so as I mentioned, we can't, not everything runs on Linux. So the things that don't, we have links to those tools, and I'll show you what that looks like when we get into the live demo in a few slides, but we don't have iOS emulators on this because they just won't install one here, right? We can't run them on here. But we include the links to tell you more about those so you can then go set those up on a different machine and be able to use them. But at least now you're not Google searching all over the world. Hey, what can I use to do this? We'll tell you what to use. We just couldn't install it because it doesn't work on this system. Uh, same thing if it's like a BlackBerry tool or something like that. Forensics tools. Again, I mean, if we're, you're doing stuff for forensics idea, you want to extract data, configurations from the devices, a whole bunch of tools that are installed for this. Some examples are the SQLite Spy, uh, if you want to go in and look at SQLite databases, um, SleuthKit, BitPim. So there's a whole bunch of tools that are already available. And once you go into forensics, you see these tools there. And we'll look at each one of these types when we go into the live demo. So you can see those. For pen testing, we've got broken up based on our way we want to go, right? Our methodology. So our recon, our mapping, our discovery, our exploitation. Pen testing tools are broken up into these subcategories. So we can see for recon, we've got tools like Maltigo installed, ready for us to go. For mapping tools, Durbusters there, Nick2. Cool. I mean, again. These must look familiar if you've done any pen testing. These are the same type of tools because a lot of what we're doing with mobile applications is connecting to these network services, web services, other applications. So why not use the same tools to work that? For discovery, Burp Suite. I mean, I use Burp Suite all the time when I'm doing mobile applications. Uh, a little bit trickier sometimes to set up to get it to work properly. Uh, but most applications allow it, so that's pretty good. Sometimes you'll find an application does certificate pinning where it won't accept the BERT cert, and that becomes a little bit more of a problem. Uh, but fortunately, for a tester standpoint, we're not seeing a lot of applications doing that. Uh, from a business standpoint, we want to see more people doing that because it does make it much harder for somebody to intercept the traffic if they're pinning and saying, hey, you're, this app will only talk to my certificate. It won't talk to anybody else's certificate. Uh, so that's good. Uh, Mallory, Spike Proxy, Zap Proxy, again, a whole bunch of proxies that are already available. And most of these are the same proxies that we're using in our web pen testing, if you happen to do that. Exploitation tools, so we got SQL Map installed, Beef is installed, Metasploit is already installed but we don't have a whole bunch of other exploitation tools that really wouldn't help us in the mobile world. Uh, but again, as you see, a lot of these are similar to what we see for web pen testing and what you see in Samurai WTF that we're exploiting in most of the same ways, depending on where that vulnerability is. So for, for reverse engineering, uh, this is where you're gonna see our disassemblers, our decompilers, so the APK tool is there. Dex to jar, the Java decompiler. Uh, Dex to jar is pretty cool, being able to take some of those files and put it out to jar files so you can go in and decompile them. For wireless analysis attacks, Aircrack NG, Kismet. Um, again, I mean, if we have to go in and start doing this stuff, the key tools that we need are already available for us. So our live demo, I'll drop out of this PowerPoint real quick here and we'll see. The MobiSec environment, let's see if it requires me to put a password in. No. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, anybody have any idea what the password may be? Um, just like as we stick with, with all the other frameworks that are out there, it is just MobiSec. 
so not too tricky to get into. I would encourage you that if you actually install this, that you actually go in and change your password um, to not be Mobisec. So that way, if somebody comes across this on your network, I mean, I can just imagine doing a pen test and coming across a server that is Mobisec and it's got Mobisec as the default password, um, allowing us to get in and, and pretty much own that box. Not something we really want to leave out on our network if we do that. So make sure you lock it down, change the password to it, um, so you don't end up, the guy that's testing actually gets owned because we screwed up and didn't change the password. Um, so here we can see on the desktop, it does have the install release. So if you actually want to just install it into a VM, you can do that. Uh, there's also a PDF regarding the firewall. Um, so it's by default set up to not allow a whole lot of traffic in and out. So you can go in there and actually, it walks through setting it up to be able to allow traffic to go through as you need it. Uh, it can be a problem sometimes. People first load it up and then all of a sudden they can't do anything because, wait, wait a minute, this isn't working. So I just want to quickly walk through and let you see some of the menu systems that we have in here. And as you can see here, everything falls under the Mobisec header. We've got development tools, which then breaks down development environments. So we got Android SDK, but then see how we got these little blue circles with an I, which is our info kind of idea. So these aren't here. Right, because we can't install the Apple Xcode IDE on this type of system. So if you click on one of these though, it'll actually pull up basically a text file that tells you where you need to go to get it, what version is the new version, um, just kind of all kinds of information about it. This one here requires registration, so here's where you go to register. Here's the download link. Everything you need to be able to go out and get that tool because it doesn't work on this environment. So you see, unfortunately, in the mobile world, there's a lot of items that, are, that fall under this, I can't use it on this device type of situation. Uh, but we've got Droidbox, we've got Eclipse IDE, um, obviously Windows Phone SDK, not going to work on this system either, but it gives you the information where to go. Our emulators, so we've already got three Android emulators on here. There's a Security Compass Lab server, uh, if you've used their mobile kind of test application that's set up out here so you can use those um, and then some information about BlackBerry simulators but again those won't run on here. For forensics you can see the list of items that are here. Again still a lot of items that are informational but there's a lot of good programs that are actually already installed on this thing uh, to allow you to just get in and start using these. For mobile infrastructure really more of like your BlackBerry, Enterprise Systems, Express, Google Mobile Management, iPhone Configuration Tool. Again, this will provide the information you need to be able to go out and get those and install them and run them. For pen testing, as we saw in the slides, goes right into, well, reconnaissance, where, where we see Maltigo, mapping, so we can see the tools that are there. Discovery, again, where we have our Burp Suite, our Mallory, Zap Proxy is already there. And then exploitation, where we see Metasploit, we see Beef, uh, all kinds of cool tools that are already involved. You see most of these, because we do them in the web as well, um, they do run on this system. So it's much easier to have a lot of those installed already, which makes it pretty nice. Uh, reverse engineering, so there's the APK tool, Dex to Jar, right? I mean, you click any of these, and it automatically pops up, will already put you in the proper directory if it's a terminal application. So that way all you have to do is start typing in your commands and run it. You don't have to now go find out, oh, I'm in slash op slash mobisec slash reverse engineer slash this. Just run it from the, the menu prompt and it automatically moves you and sets everything for that to run properly, uh, which is kind of nice. So I'll close that down. Um, and then again, here's our wireless analyzers. Uh, so you can see like Ubertooth for Kismet, uh, Wireshark, Aircrack NG, all provided on here for us. So it's a simple layout. I mean, everything else, I mean, that everything Mobisec-wise is under that Mobisec header. But it's also got everything else that comes on your standard Ubuntu distribution. Um, so, you know, all the other tools that are normally there that you're used to are still all available. 
All right, so we'll move along as we're running low on time. Um, so the Mobisec build, um, single 32-bit processor, two processors preferred, um, one gig of memory. I always like two gigs of memory if I'm putting it into a VM, uh, just because it runs a little bit better. Burp can sometimes use quite a bit of memory depending on how much you're using it. 15 gig hard drive, more if you want to customize it. Again, you know, this is shrinking down onto a DVD for distribution, but when you actually load it onto a system, the more information you want to put onto it, depending on how long you use it before you clear it, um, you may want more, more hardware or, or more hard drive space than what you have. If you want to use the Ubertooth stuff, you have to have a USB port. I don't know how many computers out there don't really have USB ports, but you'll want that. You'll want having some sort of network, uh, wireless network available 802.11 for Wi-Fi analysis, if that's part of the assessment that you're doing. Um, the Ubuntu OS hardened from default install, right? So it already presents a small attack surface, um, but no impact to any of the tools. And we've made sure that the tools don't have any impact for that. The only thing you might see is, again, that firewall being set up initially, you might have to go in and open something up to be able to use some, but that's pretty rare. <clears throat> the DARPA CFT, we actually did this uh, through the DARPA CFT, and the idea was is that DARPA did this, basically a call for technology. They were looking for small companies or, or smaller companies to be able to produce smaller projects, smaller budgets, um, to be able to produce some stuff that other people could actually use that would be useful. And so we went, we, we signed up for this, we presented this project of Mobisec and it went through the entire process and got accepted. So it was basically our way of being able to fund the creation of this tool. Because as I mentioned earlier, these tools aren't free to create, they take time, right? And even if it's just a weekend, although this took me more than a weekend, Right? It takes time to find the tools, install the tools, configure the tools, keep everything updated. So it was the DARPA CFT program that helped us uh, to be able to help fund a little bit of that and get this built up so we could build this up and share it with everybody and make it open source. Um, so big thanks to that program. Um, it's since ended that current track, um, but they may open some other stuff. So if you're interested, definitely check out the DARPA stuff as they do do some pretty neat things. Um, OWASP, if you're thinking about web, uh, mobile security, um, the OWASP mobile security project, which was announced back in Q3 of 2010, it's very active. As a matter of fact, um, Mobisec is now the OWASP Mobisec project um, as it's been accepted over an OWASP, so it's actually part of the OWASP mobile security project. So you can actually go out to OWASP site and find information about Mobisec and see how it is set up, how it's going. You can uh, download it, all that stuff. Um, OWASP has always been a great resource for providing tools, guidelines, standards, all the information you need to protect these type of environments, whether it's web, network. Um, but here they've got mobile and lots of tools out there, not just the Mobisec project, but there's a bunch of other tools as well. Uh, the project is led by Jack Menino, and you can see the URL right there out at OWASP.org. Definitely check it out. Um, if you're doing any type of mobile testing, they are a great resource for finding out some of these tools and guidelines to kind of guide you through what you're trying to do during your test. And so then, uh, just as I mentioned, we are doing, uh, Kevin and I are both teaching out at Black Hat USA, August 2nd through the 5th, if anybody's going to be out at Black Hat. Um, we teach the class. It is Mobisec, so we use Mobisec pretty much the whole time. Um, so although this was just a scratch the service, here's what the project was, hey, how it came about, this here, this class really digs into testing, and, and you know we have some application that we go in and we run some of these tests and we do some of this stuff that we're talking about. So you get real hands-on experience doing this. So that wraps up uh, pretty much the intro to the MobiSec. If there's any questions, feel free to type them into the chat window. Uh, I'll wait around for just a little bit to allow some questions to come in if you have any. Uh, 
but it definitely is a great project for people that are just starting to get into doing mobile stuff. Um, and even people that have been doing mobile for a little while, it just provides so much information. I love Backtrack and Samurai and, and Mobisec because of how easy it is for me to get the tools that I need without having to go out and try to install them and try to get them to work because that's always the hardest part. You know, once you get your tools working, you're usually pretty good. But going out and getting started and finding this information can sometimes be pretty difficult. Uh, so to have it already researched and brought together, that does make it a little bit easier. As we saw with some of the testing in there, not everything, you know, works on here because unfortunately there's so many different types of devices and they're so different. I mean, Android is so different than iOS that, you know, not everything runs on here. Uh, so doing mobile pen testing can be quite difficult because just the hardware requirements alone to be able to, one, practice this stuff and get used to it, but being able to test actual applications. I have one system set up that'll do iOS type devices, but then I need, you know, a Windows system so I can start doing Windows devices. And I need, you know, Linux situation system so that way I can do Android or, you know, any of them will really do Android since it's all Java based. But, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult sometimes making sure you have the right setup and the right tools for the job. Uh, in a lot of cases, these tools already help us. So that wraps up the intro to Mobisec. I would like to thank everybody for attending. Um, I've got this recording actually on two computers, so the chances I don't get a recording out of this are pretty low, unless all of a sudden both my computers die at once. Uh, so hopefully the recording will come out good. We'll post the recording shortly. Um, so that way, if you've got anybody else that's interested in listening to this, um, or if you want to go back and listen to any of the, of the parts of it, We'll have that recording available for you. If you want to reach out to me, feel free. Uh, my email is james at secureideas.com, or you can find me on Twitter, at Jardine Software is my handle. Uh, and I'm on there quite a bit. I'm on and around pretty much everywhere. Check out our blog. Um, again, thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoyed the training that we had.